Good day. Uh, today uh, we're going to be going to the frozen heart of the Arctic, Iceland and Greenland. And yes, you're right, the old story that Greenland is, has more ice than Iceland and Iceland is more green is correct. We'll be coming back to that though at a later time. Now, it's pretty easy to tell why Greenland is where it is. It's part of the North American continent, and it moves along with that continent. Uh, but why is Iceland where it is? Well, uh, it is right on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And what that means is that it's at that series of largely underwater uh, volcanoes and mountains that are halfway uh, between the Old World and the New World. And it is where North America and South America split away from Africa and Europe and so forth. So why is Iceland above the water and the rest of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge pretty much below the water? Well, one interesting a theory that I've heard is that it is possible that at some time in the past a large meteorite hit the earth and it happened to hit right on the mid-Atlantic Ridge and that caused a tremendous a volcanic eruption. Iceland still has quite a few volcanoes. It may be true. Iceland does have plenty of volcanoes. It's above a hot spot, and that hot spot doesn't move on the planet, uh, much like the hot spots in Hawaii and uh, Yellowstone. They're fixed, but the continents float over them, and uh, Greenland has floated over the Iceland hot spot uh, and started about 100 million years ago, and that track can still be detected in the geology of Greenland. Later time. I want to start out by uh, talking, uh, by using the Wayback Machine. I want to go all the way back to around uh, 330 BC. Now 330 BC is the time of Aristotle and Alexander and a lot of your uh, Western history, uh, civilization, uh, science classes, philosophy classes will start at about this date, and, and for good reason. There was a lot of really good thinking going on at that time, and it got written down. Um, but this particular person that I want to talk with you about, he wasn't on mainland Greece. He was in what is now the French city of Marseille. Now, Marseille uh, at that time was called Marsala, and it was a, a Greek city. It wasn't yet Roman. And uh, before that, it had been a Phoenician trading post. And the city had been there for a very long period of time, and, and trade was the lifeblood of the city. 
And a lot of the merchants in town noticed that there were some really expensive cargo coming in from the north, like amber and such. And they wondered where it came from and if they could bypass the middlemen. And so they thought about sending an expedition out. Now there was a guy by the name of Pythias and uh, Pythias wasn't a merchant. He was an astronomer, but he was a world-class astronomer. Uh, he was the first person to accurately locate the latitude that Marseille was on. And he did that with a gromon. Now a gromon is that part of a sundial uh, that sticks up and makes a shadow for you to be able to tell what time it is. He used that in order to be able uh, to identify the latitude that the city was on. And so they decided that he was the right person to captain uh, this particular trip. And so we're talking about April of about 330 BC. And he sets sail. And he goes out through the pillars of Hercules on a galley, or maybe even a fleet of galleys. Now remember, these are uh, Mediterranean galleys, like the Greek and Roman galleys that you saw on Ben-Hur and some of the other shows. And these are designed for the relatively placid Mediterranean and not for the stormy Atlantic. So these are not ideal ships. Incidentally, they are not rowed by galley slaves. Galley slaves uh, are an Arabic innovation. At the time, those oars were being pulled uh, by working people. They were basically uh, GS-1 uh, government employees on the warships. And people fought to get those jobs. And the reason that they did is because Athens, just a little before classical times, discovered silver in the Laurium mines near Athens. And so they had lots of first-class silver that they were producing, and they were knocking out very interesting little silver coins. And uh, everybody, of course, wanted some, and so people were signing on to row galleys uh, in order to collect some coin. Now, the Romans and the, and the Greeks um, used these only on the Mediterranean, they are low board ships, not designed for deep ocean. Nevertheless, Pythias takes his out onto the ocean and he, we know that he goes up to Britain. We know that because he talks about the tin mines up there. Now, tin was a strategic resource at the time. You need tin in order to make bronze. The other thing that you need is copper and that you would probably get from Cyprus. Cyprus means copper. In any event, we're pretty sure that he circumnavigated uh, Britain because he describes the general shape of the island and size. And then he goes further north. We're pretty sure that he made it at least to the Faroes or the Orkneys or Shetland. But he might have made it to Norway, Iceland, and Greenland. Because in the end, he says that he was stopped uh, because the fog and the atmosphere and the sea and the land all looked pretty much the same and he was having a tough time going and he described something which might be pack ice. But he also says that in addition to the ice, he saw fire. And we believe that that must be a volcano that he's talking about. Now, Iceland has both ice and fire in that sense. And so it's entirely possible that he made it to Iceland. Now, when he got to his final stop, the place beyond which he couldn't go any further, he called that Ultima Thule or Ultima Thule. The Ultima means the farthest out. Uh, the Thule 
or the Thule. That means the place where the sun rests. And what he noticed uh, was that sun daylight uh, might last for 22 hours where he was at. Now that puts him someplace north of Iceland, the latitude north of Iceland, assuming that the 22 hours is correct. And from that point, he had to come uh, back down. Now, we don't have his book anymore that he wrote. His book was entitled something like um, uh, Around the Ocean, uh, in Greek, of course. Uh, and, and that book is lost, but a number of other authors do comment uh, on his book. And what they say, basically, is that they don't believe it. Uh, they don't believe it for a couple of different reasons. One of the reasons is because the Greek theory at the time was that the world was divided into five zones. There was a torrid zone near the equator, which was very hot, a moderate zone that Greece is in, and then there were the two pole zones. And each of those pole zones were so cold that people couldn't live there. Now, this is the same theory that also drove the Greeks to believe that the Phoenicians, a couple of centuries earlier, had not circumnavigated Africa. The Phoenicians took two years to do it. They had been sent out by an Egyptian pharaoh. Uh, and what they did was they reported uh, not only that they crossed the equator and, and came back uh, down into more moderate temperatures, uh, but also that when they crossed the equator, the sun was in the northern hemisphere. Now, the Greeks knew that the sun was always in the southern hemisphere and therefore disbelieved the Phoenicians for the same reason that we believe them now. If you're in the southern hemisphere on Earth, the sun does appear to be in the northern hemisphere of the sky. In any event, uh, Pythias wasn't widely received and, and uh, well regarded uh, in ancient times. And so you don't see very much about him. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move forward in time a little bit. The Romans under uh, Julius Caesar uh, conquer Gaul and the Gauls are continuously revolting. Uh, one of the reasons that they're revolting is because their neighbors up in Britain are encouraging them to revolt. And so Julius Caesar sends an army across the English Channel to put down the revolting Gauls. Uh, he doesn't occupy the island. He just thrashes them a little bit and leaves. He just wants to leave the message that the Romans can cross the English Channel if they want to. So don't muck around in France. So anyway, the Romans don't want to go to Britain for a long time, but eventually Claudius, Emperor Claudius, decides to invade Britain and he takes several legions across and he does occupy England, although he never occupies what is today Scotland. In those days, that was where the Picts were. The Scots were in Ireland at the time, but that's a different story. Anyway, the point is uh, that the Romans occupied England for such a long time that the Britons became very Romanized and very civilized. And then in about the fourth century, when the Romans had to start withdrawing their army, the Britons were largely undefended. The island was not really very defensible at all. And the Picts from the far north started raiding into the south. And the Britons started looking for allies and they saw some Saxons over in Europe uh, that they could hire as mercenaries. And so they brought them over to help defend them against the Picts. Now that turns out to have been a major strategic error because the Saxons settled down. They never left England and they brought all their neighbors and relatives over. 
and they started occupying more and more of the British countryside and pushing the Britons further and further to the west until the Britons were pushed into Wales and Cornwall and that part of France called Brittany, that's from the Romanized Bretons that fled England when the uh, Saxons were attacking. That's about the fourth and fifth and up to the sixth century. Now, I want to digress a little bit at this particular point, but I'm going to be able to tie it in to another sixth century story. You see, my surname, my family name is Hodge. And Hodge is a very, very old name. It's so old that you can find it in a different form um, back a couple of millennium. The, the oldest version of the name is Roth E's Gesis. Um, now, the first word means glorious or famous or something like that. And the second one is a reference to a spear or a javelin. And so my last name means famous spear. Now, this name appears in virtually every European language, one way or the other, but it's usually spelled and pronounced differently. The most common spelling and pronunciation is something like Roger, uh, because the first two letters of the oldest spelling are H and R. So it, you could start it out either with an H or with an R. <clears throat> now, the reason I'm bringing that up is because in the 6th century, in Denmark, uh, there was a Danish king. And if we used his uh, modern English name, uh, he would be called Hodge. But in the older uh, language, he would have been Rothgar. Well, Rothgar had a problem. And his problem was that he was being attacked by a monster called Grindel. Now, this story is recorded in Beowulf, but Hrothgar we know from several different sagas of the period. So we know that Hrothgar was a real person at a real particular point in time. Beowulf comes down to uh, get rid of uh, Grindel and Grindel is impervious to swords. So Beowulf rips his arm off. Now that does eventually kill uh, Grendel. Grendel escapes uh, the, the hall that he was attacking and uh, he dies later from his wound. Um, but that's not exactly the end of the story because Grendel's mother then comes to uh, 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 avenge his death and uh, Beowulf has to dispatch her as well. So the story of Beowulf, the core story of Beowulf has a main supporting ca uh, actor in it, who's the king of Denmark, and he's named Hodge. Uh, incidentally, my middle name is Edward. The ward part of it is easy to figure out. It's also German, uh, and it, it refers to ward or guardian or warden. Uh, it's someone who protects. And the ed part of it is a very old word for cattle. Although even by uh, medieval times, it didn't have to mean cattle. Uh, it could be uh, any kind of portable property, not real estate, but it could be money, for example. My first name is Craig. That's not German, unlike the other two. It's, it's Celtic. And that means the rock. And so I figure that my name says that I'm a famous spearman on a rock guarding cattle. After the sixth century, the population in Scandinavia begins to increase. 
We're not too sure just exactly why it's increasing, but there was a warming period, a global warming period, starting around 7, 800 and going on to 11, 1200, something like that. And that probably increased the crops that were growing in Scandinavia. And as a result of that, the population exploded and there wasn't enough land for everybody eventually. And so second and third sons had to find something else to do other than to do whatever their family tradition was. And some of them went to the east and some of them went to the west. Now, the ones that went to the east, they were going up and down the rivers of what is today Russia. Uh, and there they were referred to as the Rus. And that is where Russia gets its name. It's from the Vikings that took over the governments, not the Slavic peoples that were there. They are the Rus. And not only did they take over those villages and stuff, but they took over the major city of Kiev. And from Kiev, uh, they sent people down to Byzantium. Sometimes uh, they uh, appear as uh, the personal bodyguard of the Byzantine emperor. Uh, but that's a different story. I'm going to be talking about the Vikings that went to the West. Incidentally, Viking is not what you are, it's what you do. That is, one goes a Viking. That is, you go trading and raiding. And with the Vikings, there wasn't much difference between trading and raiding. They might do both on the same trip. In any event, uh, they were trading and raiding, uh, mostly raiding, uh, because uh, knocking over isolated monasteries was lucrative. Um, in, in England and Ireland, and they ended up occupying almost all of England. Only Alfred the Great held them out of Wessex. And they also occupied parts of Ireland. Uh, Dublin, for example, is, an, uh, is not an Irish city. It's a Viking city in its origin. Uh, and... Uh, they also occupied substantial portions of, of France. And they used to sail up the, the Seine River every once in a while and attack Paris. Well, the French kings were not amused by that. And uh, they, they tried to think of a way to protect themselves from the Vikings. And so they ran upon the theory, to catch a thief, you need a thief. So they hired a, a Viking chieftain named Rollo Redpants and his people. Now, Rollo had been part of the group that had attacked Paris earlier, so he was quite familiar with the neighborhood. And it turned out to be a brilliant decision because Rollo Redpants became Duke of Normandy. Normandy, of course, is a reference to the fact that it was occupied by Norsemen, Northmen. Uh, and uh, he, he was loyal to, to the king and, and kept the other Vikings out. At the time, that was thought to be a bad idea. And the king's name was Charles the Simple. Now, Charles the Simple means what you think it does. Uh, the people thought he was something of an idiot because this had been tried before and it didn't work in different contexts. But they used to have wonderful names uh, for, for people in the Middle Ages. There's Charles the Hammer and Sickle of God and Charles the Bald and, and all that sort of thing. Philip the Fair. Uh, Philip the Fair has nothing to do with his sense of justice. He was a uh, fairly complected, he was light colored, complected person. Anyway, uh, they have wonderful names for people back in those days. And one of the things that happens during these raids is that the Vikings become themselves more and more Christianized. And eventually, Harold Fairhair, who was king at one time of uh, Norway, he goes Christian. And uh, this causes some problem in his kingdom because a fair number of Vikings were not inclined to be Christians. 
they were inclined to the old time religion. They didn't want this newfangled Christian stuff. Well, while all this was going on, Viking ships were sailing all around uh, the North Sea to the Faroes and the Shetlands and things like that. And occasionally one of them would get blown off course. One got blown off course and it found land where it hadn't known that there was land before. And they referred to the land as Schneeland. Now, based on my thorough understanding of German, I believe that that means snow land. Eventually it becomes Iceland. In any event, they don't know that it's an island at that time, but another ship is blown off course later on and it does circumnavigate Iceland and confirms that it is a large island. So the Vikings knew pretty early on uh, that there was an island out there, a large island, either uninhabited or nearly uninhabited. Well, when Harold Fairhair went Christian, another Norwegian decided he had had enough and he was going to pack up and create a colony uh, on Iceland. And in order to do that, he got three ravens. Now, this is interesting because ravens are, um, in Viking lore, a sacred bird. Uh, just like the way that the Romans uh, glorified eagles. Every time that a Roman legion went out, it had a standard and on the top of the standard, there would be a golden eagle. Well, the, the Vikings used ravens and he got these three ravens and had them uh, consecrated and he sailed with them and his colony to the Pharaohs and from the Pharaohs, they sailed in the general direction of Iceland. The first raven that he let loose flew back to the Faroes Islands. <clears throat> the second one that he let loose a little later flew up on the mast because he couldn't see land anywhere. He couldn't sense where land was located. A little later, they let go the third raven and he flew to Iceland. And so they knew precisely where it was. They just followed the bird. Now, that's a little bit easier than you would think uh, because the gap between the Faroes and Iceland is about 240 miles, but there's a volcano on Iceland that you can see for about 100 miles out to sea. And so they only had to get a little over halfway there before they could see where the island was located. Vicious Vikings! When we sailed to new lands, we Vikings had some pretty cunning ways of navigating. Come on! We must be close to land. What are you doing? What? Nothing. Are we lost? <laughs> Don't be silly. You're supposed to be navigating. If you've got us lost again, the captain's going to cut your arms off and feed them to the sharks. No, we're not lost, all right? That's the sea and that's the sky, all right? And we're in between them, on the sea and underneath the sky, which is exactly where I thought we'd be. Look at me. Are we lost? Yes. Right. Thought so. Good thing I brought this then, isn't it? What's in there? A raven. <laughs> we're in the middle of the sea. What use is a bird? It's the latest Viking trick. This raven is very hungry. When I let it out of the box, it will soar up into the sky, and if it sees land, it will fly straight for it looking for food. All we have to do is follow. Sat Rav. Wow, what a good idea. We'll find land in no time. Really? Yeah. Fly, raven, fly! I think it's a bit too hungry. Yeah, I probably should have fed it a little something. It's true. Vikings really did sometimes use... Now, when they got there, they discovered uh, that the island was not um, entirely uh, unoccupied. 
uh, there were some Irish Christian monks there. The Christian monks uh, always were looking for isolated places where they could practice their religion and not be bothered. And with the Vikings running around Ireland, uh, they couldn't find a, a good isolated place on Ireland. And so they had left to go to other places. Uh, this is also the, the basis for the reason about the stories of uh, uh, Brendan the Bold. Brendan the Bold uh, was an Irish monk who uh, sailed all around the, the North Atlantic and had various adventures, might have been in America. Uh, one of the adventures that I really like is he's out on the Atlantic and uh, sailing around and he sees an island and he pulls his boat up to the island and he starts building a campfire. It's at that point uh, that the whale wakes up and realizes his back is on fire and is not amused and uh, he, he dives. Uh, uh, Brendan uh, is, is okay, he makes it back into his boat, but he's rather startled by the island taking off. In any event, there are all kinds of Irish monk stories at about this time. They're doing the same thing a little bit ahead of the Vikings. The Irish monks on Iceland, they didn't want to have Vikings in their neighborhood, and so they left. Now. I don't know where they went to, but they went away. This brings us up to about 1000 AD, the time of Eric the Red. Now, Eric the Red was not born Eric the Red. He was called that because uh, he probably had red hair. Uh, but he was Eric Thorvald's son. Uh, Thorvald, his father, uh, had been exiled from Norway for murder. You see, Norway was using Iceland as a penal colony, much the way the British used uh, Georgia or Australia. And the undesirables were sent to Iceland, and er uh, Eric, uh, Eric's father uh, was uh, considered an undesirable in Norway. Eric the Red had the same sort of temperament as his father, apparently, and he murdered somebody on Iceland, and he was also exiled. Uh, he got in a boat, and he took off, and he discovered Greenland, and he thought it was a wonderful place, and he went back to Iceland in order to find volunteers to settle Greenland. Vikings ate seal blubber in settlements like their one in Iceland, so named because it was, well, icy. When Eric the Red was exiled and wanted to start his own settlement somewhere even icier, he had to fool other Vikings into joining him. Hi, I'm Eric the Red. Are you a Viking looking for a fresh start? Then why not move to the sun-drenched paradise that's so clean and fertile, we've called it Greenland! We only moved here because you were exiled from Iceland and wanted to be chieftain of somewhere else. Mom! Well, what's the point of being chieftain of Greenland unless you find some people to rule? Don't listen to her. Magnus just moved here and he loves it. I love it. We're looking for young Vikings to come and join the party here in Greenland. Pour me a drink, Magnus. I can't. The beer is frozen. And look, the jug is frozen to my hand. I got a jug hand. <laughs> Don't believe what you've heard. The weather here is great, and the land is so fertile. Why else would we call it Greenland? To encourage people to move here, even though it's freezing and there's no food? Mom! <laughs> I've lost a thumb. It must have got so hot it went to find some shade. We're so lucky to live here. That's why Mom's gone to Greenland. Oh, you stupid boy. Now give me my furs. I'm freezing here. Peabody here with another serving of instant history. The Wayback Machine's all set to go, Mr. Peabody. So are we, Sherman. Our course for today is due north. You mean north? I mean Norse. We are going to Norway. The year is 995, and the unforgettable personality we shall palaver with will be none other than that renowned explorer, Leif Erikson. The transition through time was in... This brings us to Leif Erikson, that is, Eric the Red's son. Uh, Leif 
had uh, turned over uh, because he was a Christian by this time. He adopted that newfangled religion, and he did not commit murder on Greenland, but he did do some exploring, and he went to a place that he called Markland and Vinland, uh, which is apparently uh, the eastern coast of, uh, of Canada and Newfoundland. Now, Markland means forest land, um, and Labrador does have forests. Um, however, Vinland means that it's a wine or a grape growing area. And grapes have never grown in Newfoundland, which is where most people put Vinland. So I assume uh, that Vinland was actually further south, uh, perhaps uh, as far south as, let's say, where Boston is today. However, the Vikings didn't make a permanent settlement that we know of in the Boston area. They did make a permanent settlement in the Newfoundland area and the remnants of the one in Newfoundland is still around. I figure that the reason that they didn't make a permanent settlement in the Boston area was that the rent was too high. We also know that the Vikings fought with the local Native American Indians. Uh, the Vikings referred to them as Skraelings, uh, which is uh, not exactly uh, an honorific term. Greenland was evacuated not uh, too long after this. There had been Vikings for several hundred years on Greenland. But when Eric the Red uh, found Greenland, it was considerably more green uh, than it later became. You see, Eric the Red arrived at Greenland just at the peak of the medieval warm period. So Greenland was as green as it was going to be getting. By the time that the Vikings left, they had already started the Little Ice Age. The Little Ice Age may actually have been triggered by a volcanic eruption in Indonesia, which occurred at about uh, 1257. Uh, it made uh, temperatures much colder in Iceland and Greenland. Today, Iceland is an independent country. Uh, it's a little bit warmer than uh, Greenland, even though it's at about the same latitude, because um, Iceland is warmed by the Gulf Stream to a certain extent on the eastern side and the southern side, whereas uh, Greenland, which is still part of Denmark, uh, is surrounded by cold water on both sides. Uh, Greenland also has the largest ice sheet uh, any place on the planet outside of Antarctica.
If you're familiar with the television series The Game of Thrones, the thing that you probably remember quite well is the wall. It's a huge ice wall uh, that separates uh, the northern part of the Seven Kingdoms uh, from the further north uh, where the wildlings are at. It's a defensive structure, uh, something over a thousand feet uh, tall. And at the top of it uh, and around behind it there are uh, defenses of various kinds. One of the things that uh, this has is it has an elevator uh, that goes from the top of the wall all the way down uh, to the bottom. The wall reminds me a great deal of Hadrian's Wall in England, uh, which the Romans built and which separated northern England from the barbarian tribes to the north. Uh, this is somewhat similar in that it seems to be separating uh, the seven kingdoms from looks like Gaelic speaking uh, people that are on the north side, people that are red haired, blue eyed and barbaric. This wall was filmed for the show in Iceland, uh, and in a sense, the wall actually exists. Iceland, where we're headed, lies right on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. That's the place where the old world separated from the new world, and they've been drifting back ever since. Iceland is right at that spot, and the Mid-Atlantic Ridge goes right through the center of the island. And on one side of that split, you have Europe, and on the other side, you have America. This is also where the Game of Thrones wall was shot, although it's a little bit different looking in the show. These walls are separating slowly and they're leaving a floor down underneath them of several hundred feet. Uh, this is also the location where the Iceland Parliament first met in 930. Uh, now they met here because they used the walls as an amplifying device uh, for their speeches so everybody could hear. Uh, as a result of the meeting in 930, uh, Iceland used to claim that it had the oldest uh, parliament. Uh, but in fact, uh, that parliament didn't meet continuously and the Isle of Man objected uh, because their parliament, which met for the first time about 50 years later, is more continuous. Now back in the earliest days of the Iceland Parliament there was no written Icelandic language and uh, so uh, Iceland went around and studied uh, everybody else's laws and then 
somebody on Iceland had to memorize all of the laws that Iceland decided to keep. And that person was called the lawgiver. Uh, now, when Iceland uh, finally uh, decided that it needed to have a written language and, and wrote one down, of course, the lawgiver no longer had to memorize all the law, and he was something much closer to simply a lawyer. Vikings. Hi, I'm a Sheltie man, and I'm here to tell you about the new runic alphabet, the easy to carve writing system that's taking the Viking world by storm. Do you have a bad memory? Or perhaps you have a bad memory? Or maybe you even have a bad memory? Then the old Viking system of learning things off by heart is not for you. But don't worry, help is at hand with the sensational new runic alphabet. The simple angular letters can be quickly carved into any wall, rock, or twig, making writing things down the new not writing things down. Yes, using new Viking runes means that this simple stick can be turned into a prayer to the gods, a personal message, a business letter, or an expression of affection. Thank you, Joe. I feel a bit the same way. And when you're finished, it makes an excellent dog toy. Fetch, boy! And that's not all. The new runic alphabet was discovered by the Viking god Odin, so it has mystical powers. Mm -hmm. Simply carve healing charms into a whalebone to help heal the sick. Now read that four times a day. That's Shouty Man Junior. And why not let people know where you've been with some good old Viking runic graffiti? Olaf was here. To be honest, I think they already knew you were here, mate. So order new runic alphabet today because the writing's on the wall for not writing on the wall. We Vikings used to write runes on stones called, wait for it, rune stones. Some tell of how we embraced a new religion. May I help you, sir? Um, yeah, I'm looking for something for my wife. Ooh, very nice too, sir. And what did you have in mind? Well, she's quite religious, so I was thinking some sort of amulet. Ah, I have the very thing. How about this delightful Thor's Hammer amulet cast in solid silver from this handcrafted sipstone mould? It's the ideal way to honour the Norse god of thunder. Ah, actually, my wife and I don't worship the Norse gods anymore. We've converted to Christianity. I see. Well, in that case, I highly recommend... This Christian crucifix amulet, cast in solid silver from this handcrafted soapstone mold. It's the ideal way to honor your Christian god, father and son. Come off it. That's just the hammer one the other way up. You clearly cast from exactly the same mold. Oh, no, no, not at all, sir. For as you can see, the Thor's hammer amulet is mold number 66, and the crucifix one is mold number 99. I see, well, that's my mistake then. I'll take the crucifix one, please. That'll be nine silver clippings, sir. There you go. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, wait a minute, sir. I said nine, and this is only six. I turned up the other way. This is the same division between the old world and the new world, but we're standing on the old world. The new world is across the valley. Next, we're taking a helicopter uh, to a volcanic area uh, just south of where the wall was that I pointed out to you.
We're still in the area where Iceland is splitting between the old world and the new world, um, but this time it's a little less clear uh, than it was uh, before. This is a geologically active area. Uh, there are uh, volcanoes. and we're going to be landing at that fumarole just ahead. If this looks like Yellowstone National Park, well it should. The phenomenon are essentially the same. Something like 80% of all of the world's geysers and fumaroles and such are found on Iceland, Yellowstone National Park, and the Kamchatka Peninsula in Siberia. Iceland gets virtually all of its hot water and heating for homes and businesses uh, from geologically uh, heated uh, underground water. This means that energy in Iceland is virtually free. In fact, in most cases it is actually free. Now the second helicopter arrives.
for all practical purposes, this is kind of a touch and go, and we're going.
Iceland is so loaded with uh, geysers and hot springs that the word geyser is itself Icelandic, and it means something like to gush, and there is a particular geyser called geyser. Uh, some of the geysers are like the ones at Yellowstone uh, in that they uh, burst forth on a fairly regular and predictable basis. Uh, some of them uh, go up quite high, although this particular geyser is alleged to go uh, quite high, uh, I found its geysing uh, to be more of a burp uh, than a real uh, geyser. Iceland doesn't have just hot water, it also has abundant cold water. It gets about 100 inches of rain a year on the south coast, and in addition to that, uh, you've got that glacial melt. Sometimes it takes 10-15 years from the time that the uh, glacier has melted some water for the water to percolate through the stone, and the result is that all of the water on Iceland is, can be consumed. It's all good water. There's no pollution at all. And the result of that is water is for all practical purposes free. If you don't use it, it's just going to flow into the ocean. And nobody charges for it. Incidentally, you can actually walk behind this waterfall. One of the most visually stunning scenes, though, is Diamond Beach, where the ice comes up on the black sand uh, beach, and they look like diamonds. Next, we're going to a volcano, which in English would be called Snow Mountain. I'm going to pronounce it Snaefels, which is the way that I would pronounce it in German. Uh, but the Icelanders don't pronounce it quite that way, but I can't really reproduce the way they pronounce it. Now we're on the Berserker's lava field. Um, a Berserker is uh, someone uh, who's able to fight like crazy. In other words, he's Berserk. And it refers to wearing a bare shirt. That is, he has no armor on. And that's why he has to attack so viciously. Now, it turns out that there was an Icelandic farmer that owned this land at one time and he had a farmstead on one side of this lava field and a farm side, site on the other. And he went to Norway and he picked up two Swedish berserkers to work with him and brought them back here. Now the farmer also had two daughters of marriageable age and the two berserkers decided they'd like to marry him and they asked the old farmer if uh, they could and the farmer didn't want to say no. Uh, so instead what he did was he told the berserkers that if they could clear a road through this lava field within a certain amount of time, he'd let them marry the girls. Now he knew that that was practically impossible because in that period of time it would have taken 10 men and a wagon and all that sort of thing to clear this lava field. Well, the berserkers surprised him, and they cleared the lava field in lightning speed. Now the old farmer's got a problem. He's made a promise. 
And that's the way that my uh, guide told the story for the last two years. His name was Carlos, and he was from Portugal. He's not an Icelander, and he really doesn't know the story very well. And he ends the story up with the uh, girls marrying the boys, and everyone lives happily ever after. But as you probably know, no good Viking story ever ends without at least one murder. So I told him what the real story was, and he confirmed that with his tour company. So the farmer decides he's going to have a celebration opening up the road between the two farmsteads, and he invites the boys uh, to go to his sauna with him. He's got one of those stone saunas like the Romans used to make with uh, a hole in the uh, top uh, to let the smoke out. And uh, while they're in the sauna, the old farmer says he's going to go out and get some more uh, water for the sauna. Unknown to the boys, though, the farmer has some boiling vats of water uh, just outside. And he, the farmer goes out and he takes those boiling vats of water and he pours them into the hole in the sauna so that the boys are scalded so badly that they're hardly alive. And the farmer dispatches and kills them. Oh, and we're still in the Berserker's Lava Field, uh, but one of the tourists wanted to get out and take a particular picture, and that's why she's running down that way. Incidentally, the Berserker's Lava Field is located on the Snaefels Peninsula, in case you want to find it. Those rocks in the back are trolls. Trolls come out at night, and they have to get back to their homes uh, before daylight because if they're exposed to daylight, they turn to rock. And as you can see, these trolls were quite large. Icelandic trolls seem to average about 50 feet tall. This is, of course, actually a lava field. Uh, the lava probably came from the volcano Snaefels, which is there in the background. When lava cools, uh, usually the first plants that take up residence on the lava field are mosses. Uh, they're basically rootless and they cover everything, including crevasses. So if you're walking in an old lava field covered by, with moss, you have to be extraordinarily careful where you step because you could fall into a crevasse. Snaefels is the most prominent volcano on this peninsula, and the peninsula is in fact called the Snaefels Peninsula, or Snaefelness. Uh, the Ness simply means uh, peninsula. Uh, Snaefel, uh, the snay part is snow, and the fell part of it indicates it's a, a mountain, or in this case, a volcano. Uh, Snaefels is one of the most important parts of, of Iceland uh, for cultural reasons. Uh, that is, uh, Jules Verne uh, made this volcano famous. Sundown. Hey, think you can slow down a little bit, please? You got it closer. I just watch your step there. Well, Snipers is deceptively treacherous. What's Snipers? Well, why don't you tell him, Professor? Snipers is the name of the mountain where this character lighted Brock. Or apparently found a portal to the center of the earth.
Well, that was certainly a short description. Uh, Jules Verne wrote a book called Journey to the Center of the Earth in which a, a professor and a small group of people uh, go down a lava tube on this particular volcano, uh, Schneefels. And they go down to the center of the earth. But how they discovered that there was a lava tube that went down to the center of the earth is interesting all by itself. According to the story, um, there had been somebody to go down this lava tube back in the 16th century and the professor found a document uh, testifying to that fact. What does the name Arnie Sarknesom mean to you, gentlemen? Sarknesom, Sarknesom, just a yeah, second. Yeah, wasn't he the one who wrote about the, uh, the lost city of Atlantis? That was an early phase of his career. His real fame rests on his study of volcanoes. Hmm? Out of a volcano came this message from him. It lay unnoticed for a hundred years, was probably picked up by some peasant, gathered dust in a curiosity shop till it came to me. Here is a translation of the words. I am dying, but my life's work must not be lost. Whoever descends into the crater of Snaffles Yokul can reach the center of the earth. I did it. Arne Saknesum. The center of the earth? Snaffles Yokul? But... That's an extinct volcano in Iceland. According to this, there must be a direct route from it to a region no man has ever seen. But Oliver... This is sheer fantasy. You haven't heard all of it. There's a postscriptum. At sunrise on the last day of May, the mountain Scartaris will point the path. Runes are the old uh, Viking writing system, and these are the runes uh, that the professor found. Uh, however, even if you could read the runes, and he could read them, uh, they happen to be in code. And breaking the code was an interesting story. What you have to do with these letters now is to take the first letter of the first column in the first row and then match it up with the uh, second column first row and then the third column first row and so on through the message and you get something that looks like this. Next you take the message and you read it backwards and you find that it's perfectly understandable Latin. Finally, you take the Latin and translate it into English or whichever language that you happen to like. Descend the crater of the Yokul of Snaefell. The Yokul is uh, the glacier, Snaefell is the volcano. That the shadow of Scartaris, uh, that is, uh, a rocky mount, softly touches before the Calends, that is, the first of July bold traveler, and thou wilt reach the center of the earth, which I have done, Arne Sacknusum. And so we're going down a lava tube. Lava tubes are made uh, from rivers of lava. Uh, what happens is the skin of the lava cools rapidly and it creates the tube, well, whereas the lava in the center stays hot and eventually it drains away, and in Iceland's case that means drains away to the sea. We're in a lava tube, like the one that Jules Verne described in Journey to the Center of the Earth, and in his version uh, if you walked far enough down the lava tube to get to the center of the earth, you would eventually discover prehistoric animals. Of course, he walked for a considerable distance. We probably won't be going nearly that far. Thank <laughs> you. 
ones we get from the Vikings. Yeah. Anger! Berserk! Die! Cake! Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Rotten! Mistake. Hit! I want to talk a little bit about Greenland's history before we get started. You already know a little bit, you know about Eric the Red. Uh, he is one of the early discoverers of Greenland. And you know a little bit about Leif Erikson that went out to Vinland along uh, uh, with his father, Eric the Red. In total, there were about uh, four expeditions out to Vinland. And Eric's daughter, uh, her name was Freitas, Freitas, Eric's daughter. Uh, she was a half sister, probably, possibly a sister uh, to Leif Erikson, but she was on two of those expeditions. In the older expedition, we know that the party of Vikings was attacked by Skraelings, that is Native Americans. And the uh, Native American Indians had something that the Vikings referred to as rods that were being thrown at them using what the Skraelings called catapults. Well, for as far as I know, American Indians never really had catapults in the European sense of the word, but they did have something similar. Uh, they had an addle addle, and the spear from an addle addle does make noise as it goes through the air. The Atl Atl is a handheld spear thrower, launching long flexible darts from its spur. 
It's deceptively complex and in trained hands can be a most lethal weapon. Okay, wow, that's really yeah. cool. You can really see that thing curve into that, that big arc. Well, you can see how that, that flex is making it kick off from, right. from the launch stick. System. The dart tip resists acceleration. It forces the dart to store spring energy to be released against the spur of the atom. So the time to test our new weapon. Dead center. It works. Of course this it works. I'm at Atlatl Bob. Now, we know that the Indians did have the Atlatl. -Atl. As a matter of fact, the Aztecs uh, used it quite effectively. And they had it in use at the time that Cortez uh, was attacking them. Now, we know that the Atlatl -Atl is also effective against chainmail, uh, which is the kind of armor that the Vikings would have been using. Uh, we know that because one of Cortez's lieutenants was killed by an Atlatl -Atl spear. When Eric the Red's uh, Viking men were attacked by uh, Skraelings using the Adelatl or whatever the catapult happened to have been, they were terrified because they had never seen it before. Although, frankly, the distant ancestors of the Vikings had used exactly the same thing in the very distant past. In any event, they were terrified and they ran. The problem for as far as uh, uh, Friedrichs uh, Eric's daughter was concerned is that she was eight months pregnant at the time and she couldn't run. Uh, so she uh, grabbed one of the swords of the uh, fallen uh, friends that she had and uh, she used that sword to brandishing it somehow and she did it so effectively it scared the Skraelings away. The fourth uh, voyage uh, that uh, was taken to uh, uh, Vinland was actually uh, organized by Fridas, uh, Eric's uh, uh, daughter. And she went into partnership with a couple of Icelandic boys, uh, Helgi and uh, Finn Bogi. And the two of them agreed that they would split the profits evenly and they would each bring the same number of men in each of their ships. Uh, Helgi and Finbogi, the, the brothers, uh, got out on time. Uh, Fridas uh, did not get out on time, and when the brothers were gone, she packed a couple of extra men onto her ship. Well, she had made arrangements with her brother Leif, who had built uh, a, a longhouse in uh, Vinland, uh, to use that longhouse, and he said okay. The Viking longhouse looks something like this. Curiously enough, the Iroquois longhouse looks kind of similar. In any event, uh, they sometimes call that a, uh, a pigback uh, house. Uh, and it looks a little bit like a boat that's been turned upside down in some ways. And so when she got there, she discovered the brothers, the, the Icelandic brothers, had already set up camp there, and she forced them out. And that was just the beginning of uh, apparently a, a long line of complaints between the two of them. And eventually uh, she went down uh, to their settlement because they moved out of the log house and set up a separate settlement a little ways away. And uh, she made peace with them, but on her way back, she beat herself up presented herself to her husband and said that the brothers had beaten her and she demanded revenge. He, he didn't want to go at first, but she threatened divorce and threatened his manhood and everything else. And eventually he got his men together and they went out at night and they killed all of the Viking men at the settlement. But there were five Viking women there and they couldn't kill the women. Friedrichs demanded that they be killed, but the men wouldn't do it. So Friedrichs picked up an ax and she dispatched them. And then she threatened the people on her group. She said they can't say anything about this when they get back to Greenland. 
And so Friedrich gets back to Greenland and she says that uh, the brothers have decided to stay in Vinland over winter and uh, they'd meet back up the next spring. Well, eventually word does get out to, to Leif that what had happened. But she was his sister and he didn't feel like he could do anything to her. So she didn't get exiled or anything. Uh, but nevertheless, thereafter, nobody in the community trusted her. So why were they going to Vinland in the first place? Well, probably uh, lumber or grapes or something else. Uh, but one other possibility is that they were after bog iron. There are bogs on uh, Newfoundland and they do have bog iron. We are talking about the bog iron hunter. And another thing I didn't know is that iron clumps can actually form in bogs. And it is one of the only locations that you can find iron without having to mine. So in bogs, iron forms in the water as rocky clumps, which can vary in size from the size of a pea to a large skull. And this type of iron ore is commonly referred to as bog iron. It was the bog iron hunter's job to look for these clumps in the murky waters and the muddy soils of the wetlands. These people would have a trained eye to spot iron slick, which is an oily film which forms on the surface of the water and indicates the presence of iron ore. When they spotted some iron slick, the bog iron hunter would then prod the area underneath the slick with a staff or a spear or any other large stick and in that way they could find the large iron clumps in the mud. Or alternatively, they would cut out sections of the sediment, then strain them and find smaller iron pebbles. Smelting iron from bog ore was first done during the Iron Age and stayed prominent during that age. But as time went on, in most places it was replaced by mining as the primary source of iron when the mines became more efficient. During the Viking era in Europe, most of the iron was still smelted from bog ore. In Scandinavia and Russia, it stayed the primary source of iron well into the Middle Ages. Even after the advancement of the iron mines, bog ore remained important, particularly to the peasants who wanted to dabble in iron production. Iron made from bog ore will often contain small amounts of silicates, which can form a glossy coating that gives it some resistance to rusting. Bog iron isn't quite as strong as mined iron, and therefore I think it's not quite as good for swords as it is for axes. And therefore, the Vikings had a tendency to use axes. Now, the problem with an axe is you can only attack with the axe, so you have to be very, very aggressive. You really can't defend like you can with a sword. Now, what about this thing about Vinland? Was it really Newfoundland? Well, there has never been any grapes grown in Newfoundland, and that leads to some question about whether or not it is actually Vinland, which means grape land. These are not grapes. These are gooseberries, and they do grow on Newfoundland, and perhaps, although I doubt it, uh, the Vikings mistook these gooseberries for grapes. We're going to Greenland today. Uh, we're not going to Thule, even though the map has Thule on it. You've already heard about Thule. We're going a little bit further south uh, to a place where there was a U.S. Air Force base. Uh, when the U.S. Air Force pulled out, uh, they left behind the most wonderful runway in all of Greenland. The problem, of course, is there is no town there. There's just a runway. But that's where I'm flying into. And the reason is because when the Air Force moved out, they moved in about a dozen musk oxen. And it's those musk oxen that I want to see, and there are thousands of them now. When I think of Greenland, I think of glacier. But not all of Greenland is composed of glacier. Uh, there's no food uh, to speak of on the glacier. Uh, there's no way to get to it. 
you either have to be living off of uh, uh, marine uh, resources or there has to be grassland. This is reindeer country and that means there must be grass. And this is where the glacier meets the grassland. And although it looks like there's nothing to eat here for reindeer, there are in fact thousands of them in this neighborhood. Focus now on those two big blocks of ice on the right hand side. This is the leading edge of the glacier and the drop from the top to the bottom of those blocks of ice is about 50 feet. So why are we here in Greenland? Well, it's this shaggy guy. Uh, he looks like something out of the Pleistocene, and indeed he was in that period of time, and he ran around with uh, woolly mammoths and woolly rhinoceros, and he's the only one of those three that's still alive in the Arctic. Now the reason that I'm interested in them is because when I was taking advanced German, one of my assignments uh, was to translate a scientific article on muskox, scientific name ovibos, which means sheep cow, uh, but they're neither a sheep nor are they a cow, um, they're more of a goat. After World War II, these animals were very nearly extinct. Um, they had only remnant populations in uh, various places, now, they had been hunted out of Alaska, for example. But after World War II, there was a recolonization effort, and a number of the animals were moved uh, in various places where they thought that they might survive successfully. Iceland was one of those places, uh, and so was Vermont. And they couldn't make it in either Iceland or Vermont. But Siberia, Alaska, and other locations where they currently weren't in Greenland did work out just fine. Anyway, that's why we're looking for about an 800 pound goat that lives in polar regions and stands about five foot tall at the shoulder. But where to find them? Well, it turns out that there's a very interesting place that you can go to find them. It turns out that during World War II, what became the United States Air Force had to maintain a number of bases uh, in Greenland for various purposes. Uh, one of the purposes was refueling for airplanes on their way to Europe. Even afterwards, uh, it was useful in the Cold War to keep eyes on the uh, Soviets and what they were doing in the North Atlantic. And one of those bases was Sonderstrom uh, on Sonderstrom Fjord. Sonderstrom uh, Air Base uh, has closed down as a U.S. Air Force base in the 1990s, but it left behind uh, the best runway uh, in all of Greenland. Uh, it's a little bit odd because the best runway in all of Greenland doesn't have a town attached to it. And incidentally, there is some talk about closing uh, the commercial aspect of this runway down. Uh, in 2024, but if that happens, uh, the people in this little community are going to be really, really hurt. Now, those 27 animals that they brought in in the 1960s have expanded to thousands, in part because there are no predators uh, in this area, and in part because uh, there is plentiful grass, even though the area is partially glacier, it's basically gl grassland. Um, and that is an ideal situation for musk oxen and 
muskoxen normally give birth to a calf about once every year or two. But in this neighborhood, the muskoxen are so happy uh, that they're giving uh, birth to two calves per year on average. Incidentally, as you can see, muskoxen males uh, settle their disputes essentially the same way that human males do by headbutting. But back to predators. There are no predators in this neighborhood, no polar bears, no wolves, and nothing larger than an arctic fox which cannot uh, threaten even a baby muskoxen. Uh, but they do have an instinctive defensive system that I would like to show you. Musk oxen. Males stand five feet at the shoulder and weigh a massive 800 pounds. Aside from polar bears, they are the largest animals that roam the Arctic tundra. But even they are vulnerable to predators. A pack of Arctic wolves catches the herd scent. The musk oxen scramble to form a defensive ring. The adults, equipped with long, hooked horns, are more than a match for the wolves. But it's not the adults the wolves are after. Now these animals may look stupid and slow, uh, but in fact uh, they kill people from time to time. Uh, you're warned not to get within about 30 meters or so of them they are likely to charge, and that charge can be pretty terrifying. Now that brings us to Willie the muskox. You know, Willie is the only muskox that I know of that ever had a song uh, made up about him. I see by your fur, sir, that you are a muskox. I see from your eyes there's something to say. Now this is the story of Willie the musk ox shot down by a Danish gunman and it happened this way born on an iceberg in eternity's fjord a big shaggy brute with a big mighty roar first came to Sunday when he was just three he acted like he owned the whole down country now willie was probably one of the first uh, muskoxen brought into sonderstrom and uh, he was probably treated more like a pet than anything else and uh, the boys at the base probably teased him from time to time and uh, that uh, caused a problem. Uh, the result is he thought that he owned uh, the uh, entire base and surrounding area, uh, and uh, he didn't put up with uh, much baloney. Willie, Willie the muskox, mayor of Sonderstrom. Willie, Willie the muskox, mayor of Sonderstrom. Now, Willie was a visitor to Sonderstrom each year. He went where he wanted to cause Willie had no fear. All the folks at Sonderstrom left Willie alone. Cause everybody knew that Sunday was old Willie's home. Sunday was his home. Willie, Willie the muskox, Sunday was his home. Willie, Willie the muskox, Sunday was his home. Now Willie got a little older and as the years went by, he got a little meaner. He got a little shy. He took to hate people. Springtime through the fall. 
But old them big red fire trucks he hated most of all. Well, Willie used to uh, run servicemen up telephone poles and keep them there for a long periods of time. And once he had a dispute with a helicopter and the helicopter did not come out well. From time to time, they had to drag old Willie off the runway. Willie, Willie the muskox didn't like people no more. Willie, Willie the muskox didn't like people no more. Now the grass was always greener over at the Sass Hotel. They couldn't get him to leave there, there weren't no way in hell. Even Danish cowboys with a winch truck and a rope. They couldn't budge old Willie, there wasn't any hope. Like the Sass Hotel. Willie, Willie the Muscots like the Sass Hotel. Willie, Willie the Muscots like the Sass Hotel. For all you Danish cowboys. Danish cowboy went riding out one cold and frosty morn. He tried to put a rope around one of Big Willie's horns. Willie bounced to the left, then he bounced to the right, then he began to buck. Then there it was, a four-foot hole right through that red fire truck. Hated red fire trucks. Willie, Willie the muskox hated red fire trucks. Willie. Willie the muskox hated red fire trucks. Oh, clear the frozen runway, Big Willie's coming through. And if you don't move, it won't be long, he's got a piece of you. Hear the mighty roar of the muskox from a drinking Danish beer. I ain't a gonna fool with Willie, I'm getting the hell out of here. Willie, Willie the muskox ain't gonna see you no more. Willie. Willie the Muscox ain't gonna see you no more. In order to find the Muscox by air, I hired a helicopter. But the helicopter turned out to be an airplane, and the pilot is Mia. There wasn't any helicopter at Sonderstrom available. So this is a Patanavia, a P-68. And uh, you're going to be seated here on this side, I'll be on the other side. We can help coordinate. Um, as I mentioned, there will be the instrument board here and there will be this loop, but there's plenty of space for you to film around here as well and for you to have a better look ahead. During the summer, the muskox spend their time up on the glacier to keep cool. But it's October now, and the muskox should be coming down into the river valleys. But which river valley, and exactly where? So I'm going to see if I can find them by air. There's a river here that divides into two, and that creates an island in the middle. And that's where I find them. From the air, the muskoxen are just little black specks, and not moving very much. Muskoxen try to conserve their energy. The result is, you can't hardly tell the difference between a rock and a muskox. As a matter of fact, the locals have a term that they use for rocks that look like muskox. They call them musk rocks. As a practical matter, Greenland has no roads. You can't get to any place by driving there. You have to either go by boat or airplane. The longest road is the one that we're on. It's only less than 50 miles long. And it goes up to the glacier. 
Now the good news is I have a four-wheel drive vehicle. The bad news is the weather has not been cold enough. The temperature has ranged very close to freezing. And what that means is that the ground is soft and the rivers are not frozen over. So I don't have very much traffic ability. Now I know that the musk oxen are on the other side of the river and there is no road on the other side of the river. And the low ground between us and the river is boggy. We can't take the four-wheel drive vehicle in there. As a matter of fact, if we could cross the river, that would be great. Uh, we talked about the possibility of getting a Zodiac and launching it across, but we couldn't find a good location to launch it from to get across to the other side and stalk the muskox that way. While we were discussing our dilemma at the side of this little brook, uh, we were being viewed by a reindeer uh, who wondered why we were out in the snow and stopped at this little brook and doing nothing. As a final resort, we parked our vehicle at the side of the road and hiked uh, towards the, uh, the river and we got as close to the muskox as we possibly could but it was snowing and that caused a problem all by itself now that is a muskox uh, back there but uh, the snow is uh, causing my camera to have some difficulty focusing on him The next day there was no snow, but getting in close enough uh, to get good photographs was still a problem. I still had to hike over marshy ground. This time there are two of them. One of the problems that I've always had with guides is they're used to people taking photographs but not video. And the result is, while you're taking your video, they're likely to be talking, even though you've told them not to do that. Now you have to go right. On the other hand, the good news is that the muskox are moving so you're pretty sure they're not musk rocks. <laughs> <laughs> 